Good day, everyone. On behalf of Director John Adler at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, let me welcome you to the webinar on recent research on body-worn cameras. And thank you for joining in. My name is Chip Coldren. I am the Managing Director for Justice Programs at the CNA Institute for Public Research, the Director of Technical Assistance for the Bureau of Justice Assistance's Body-Worn Camera Technical Assistance Program. And I will provide a brief introduction for today's webinar. Today's webinar focuses on research findings regarding the impacts of body-worn cameras on a number of topics and outcomes of interest. Today's webinar will cover the following. <clears throat> we'll hear some opening remarks from John Markovic, who is the Senior Policy Advisor at BJA and the Director of BJA's Body-Worn Camera Initiative. Then we'll hear a discussion of research design issues and recent trends in body-worn camera research by Dr. Mike White of Arizona State University. Mike is also the co-director of the Bureau of Justice Assistance Body-Worn Camera Technical Assistance Program. Then we'll hear presentations of research findings from several recent studies on body-worn cameras. <clears throat> Mike will present on community perceptions of body-worn cameras based on research he recently completed in Tempe, Arizona and Spokane, Washington. I will present some findings related to a cost-benefit analysis we conducted as part of our body-worn camera study at the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. And Anita Ravishankar will discuss issues pertaining to the open science approach to conducting research based on a recent study conducted by the lab at DC and the DC Metro Police Department. Toward the end of this webinar, we'll have some time for questions and comments, and John Markovic will provide some complete concluding thoughts and remarks. We thank these individuals for working with us to put this webinar together and for their participation today. This is another in a series of webinars sponsored by the Bureau of Justice Assistance and coordinated by CNA for the Body Worn Camera Technical Assistance Program. We thank the Bureau of Justice Assistance for its investment in the Body Worn Camera Grant Program, in the Body Worn Camera Toolkit, and in a range of technical assistance resources and opportunities for agencies implementing body worn cameras. The Bureau, the Bureau supports state, county, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies in many, many ways, and we are grateful that they do. And we want to thank uh, Denise Rodriguez and the staff at CNA for the effort in putting this webinar together. Permit me to make a few other comments. <clears throat> this webinar is recorded for the benefit of others who may view it later on our website. As I said, there will be opportunities for questions at the end of the webinar, so please make your thoughts and questions known. I can assure you that others will appreciate hearing what you have to say. If you would like, you may use the chat utility to the right of your screen to post your questions and comments, or you can comment at the end of the webinar, and we will do our best to respond to your input. Following the webinar, you will receive a request to evaluate it. Please complete the evaluation, and please give us your honest thoughts and recommendations. And please let us know what other topics you think we should cover on future webinars. So thanks very much. And let me pass uh, the presentation over to John Markovic from BJA. Thanks, Chip. I just want to check to make sure you can hear me. I had some problems with my phone earlier. We can hear you. Okay, great. So as Chip said, my name is John Markovic. I'm a senior policy advisor with the Bureau of Justice Assistance. In that role, one of my main responsibilities is to oversee the body-worn camera program BWC PIP for short. To date, since 2015, BJA, BJA has awarded over 250 BWC grants to agencies that vary widely in size and geographic locale. They range from small rural sheriff's offices with less than 10 officers to large metropolitan police departments, including Chicago, Detroit, Seattle, and Washington, Washington DC Metro, uh, who we'll hear about today. They also include suburban police departments, unique places, tourist meccas like Las Vegas, as well as many university, tribal, and special jurisdiction police agencies. So we don't really have a random sample in statistical speak, but we were really looking at agencies that were motivated to apply for grants and that were selected through a competitive peer review process. Nonetheless, across those 250 agencies, we see a lot of variability, not just in the types of agencies and the mission, in their missions, in the types of uh, neighborhoods they patrol, but we see a lot of 
variation in many of the dimensions that are likely to affect both the, the agency and the community's receptivity to body-worn cameras and affect how the body-worn cameras might affect potential outcomes. Um, we have some cities that have been plagued by historical high levels of violence, some uh, prior to applying for body-worn camera grants and implementing those body-worn cameras. They may have had uh, officer-involved shooting or instances of civil unrest. But there are also a lot of organizations that have experienced longstanding favorable community relations, uh, good relations with the communities they serve, and they may indeed experience very few use of force incidents and complaints, uh, which are some of the main outcomes that we'll talk about today with wow. body-worn cameras. So um, each agency, though, has one thing in common. They've all developed a body-worn camera policy that's very thoughtful, comprehensive, and deliberate, and that was purposely part of the requirements of the grant program but they also differ in how they develop these policies. Each has developed them quite uniquely, reflecting their individual agency priorities, local stakeholder input, by that I mean prosecutors, police unions, citizens groups. More recently, we've seen that state legislatures are weighing in in many states on what elements of body-worn cameras matter, sometimes making prescriptive uh, legislative um, rules about adopting body-worn cameras and which direction they should go in policy. So as, so as an end result, we've, we have body-worn camera policies in the program that, for instance, require that subjects must be notified any time a PWC is used, while others suggest that this should be, that notification should happen whenever practical or practicable. And still others expressly state that officers have no uh, requirement to give notification to subjects that are being recorded. So thinking about that, that can all have impact, no matter what the jurisdiction, on the outcomes. Um, not surprisingly, um, so we see this wide variation in size and geography, the context matters. So while we're tempted, for, you know, this is a research presentation to ask the big questions, do body-worn cameras work, do they reduce complaints? Do they reduce force? Are they, use, are, they use, are they worth the cost? And are they valued by officers and citizens alike? We have to remember that this may vary by a whole host of variables, of context matters. So you're gonna see that today in the presentations when we talk about research. Um, context very much shapes how BWCs are deployed, how the policies are developed, and um, how that BWC footage is used for evidentiary purposes. Um, so you know, just to boil it down, we wouldn't expect to see a major statistically significant drop in use of force in, or complaints in some bucolic suburb that has a handful of complaints every year and even fewer use of force instances. So what we're gonna learn today from a number of rigorous research studies that have been conducted, how dynamic and evolving BWC implementation is, Keep in mind, this is a growing body of research. Nothing is definitive yet. We can talk about general trends, which Dr. White will do, but you know, there's not a um, simple solution, one size fits all solution to implementing body-worn cameras, and we wouldn't expect the research to be consistent and unequivocal given this, the importance of context. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. White. All right, thanks, John. Um, Basically what I wanted to do is just to start off the webinar by laying a bit of a, a foundation talking about some research design issues that, uh, that we need to keep in mind when we, when we think about uh, the studies that have been conducted uh, looking at the impact of body-worn cameras. And um, really what I want to do is, is cover three general areas. Um, first, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the different kinds of studies that are done, in particular a tool that we can use the Maryland Scientific Scale to assess uh, the rigor and, and um, uh, you know, how good a study is in terms of methodology. I want to then turn to the types of questions, the most common questions that are, that are asked in research examining the impact of body-worn cameras, and then just acknowledge the, the range of findings that we're seeing in some of these main areas. 
And so I'll lay that foundation and then we'll move into the more specific studies that have focused on um, uh, other kinds of more uh, specific issues. So let's start off with uh, just a, a little bit of a discussion on, on research design. And if there's one thing that, that we need to understand, it's that not all research studies are the same. Uh, research studies vary. Uh, there are, are, are different kinds of designs. And what we see here on this slide is the Maryland Scientific Scale. And this is a really useful tool for assessing, as I said, how rigorous a study is. And it's important because the, le the, the level of rigor in a study is tied to how much confidence we can have in the findings that we see. And, you know, it, with this scientific scale, you see there's five different levels. Um, basically, the higher, the better. So a level one study is not very rigorous at all. A level five study is the best. It's a randomized controlled trial. So as you, as you look at the different levels or as you move from one level to the next, really what you're seeing is that um, two things change. The first thing that changes as you move from lower to higher is, is how often you're measuring your outcome. Um, now, keep in mind that this, this uh, scientific scale can be used for, for studies on any given topic, but I'm going to obviously, given our interest, I'm going to talk about body-worn cameras. So as John had mentioned, one of the, the common outcomes of interest is use of force. So one thing that will vary from one level to the next is how often you're measuring use of force in your study. The second thing that varies is how many study groups you have. If you are carrying out a study with body-worn cameras, chances are you've got one group. You've got your group uh, of officers that has uh, assigned body-worn cameras. But do you have another group? So let me just take a minute or two and explain uh, using a hypothetical how you would move up this uh, scientific scale. And we'll start off with, with a level one study, which is the, the least rigorous. So let's say hypothetically I'm a chief of police. I've got 200 officers in my department. Um, I want to start a body-worn camera program, so I ask for 100 volunteers. Though that's my group then, my one group. That's my body-worn camera group. In a level one study, I'm going to look at my outcome of interest, use a force only one time. So I assign my 100 officers their cameras, and then I look at their, their use of force afterwards, after they've been assigned cameras. Think about that design. That's, it, it's a very weak design. You've only got your one group. You're only looking at the outcome after, not before. That's why that's considered a, a level one or the lowest level in terms of rigor. Now let's take that hypothetical and turn it into a level three. Same hypothetical. I'm the chief of police. I got 200 officers. I asked for 100 volunteers. I get those volunteers. That's my body one camera group. But in a level three study, I'm going to grab those other 100 officers and I'm going to make them my comparison group. So I have two groups now, one with cameras, one without. And I'm going to look at my outcome of interest, use of force, multiple points in time. I'm going to look for both groups. I'm going to look at use of force before cameras are rolled out. And then as well, I'm going to look after. So that's how we go from a level one to a level three by changing those two things, um, how often we measure the outcome and then um, the, the number of groups we have. And then obviously we're moving up. We want to get up to, uh, to level five, which is the randomized controlled trial. So the, the randomized controlled trial is considered the gold standard. It's, it's the most rigorous study. If we think about my hypothetical where I'm the chief of police, You'll notice in the level one and level three, I said I'm going to ask for volunteers among my 200 officers. In a randomized controlled trial, I'm not asking for volunteers. I'm going to randomly assign 100 of my officers to get cameras, and the other 100 officers will be randomly assigned to not get cameras. So that's what gets us up to that level five. And as you look at the four components here of a randomized controlled trial, obviously the random assignment, you've got that's the key. And then you've got your intervention, which goes to the treatment group. That's our body one camera group. You've got the control group that's not getting it. That's the group without cameras. And then we're going to look at our outcome, use of force, at uh, multiple points in time, pre and post the rollout of the cameras. So that's, that's how the randomized control trial works. And what that allows us to do is to make comparisons. Obviously, you want to do your b between group comparison. We're going to compare our outcome, use of force, among the group that has cameras and the group that doesn't. The other thing you can do with a randomized controlled trial is you can look at within group change. That is, we can take just one group, our body one camera group, group, and we can look over time. So how did you support change over time for this one particular group? So um, that is why it's considered the, uh, you know, the gold standard. And, and just another point on why um, this is 
really a, a different kind of beast or a different kind of study than that level three that I described. And the key is, is random assignment. So if you think about um, what I said with my officers, my 200 officers, if I do random assignment, each one of those 200 officers has an equal chance of getting a camera or not. And whether they get a camera is gonna be determined by some random process. I'll pull names from a hat or whatever I do to, to, to figure out and randomly assign to, uh, to the two groups. And the key here is that that random assignment allows us to assume uh, after it's done and we've got our two groups, it allows us to, uh, to assume the officers in those two groups are equivalent in all respects except one. And that one difference between the two groups is one got cameras and one didn't. And this is all about cause and effect, right? We want to, we want to look at our outcome, use of force. If we see differences, we want to be able to say that those differences were caused by our treatment, by our body-worn cameras. And what the, 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 uh, the randomized piece of this does is it allows us to rule out all those other competing explanations and really begin to hone in on the intervention or the cameras as the cause of that change. And that's why, uh, again, this is the, the most rigorous kind of study. Now, you may be saying to yourself, well, this is fantastic. Why don't we all do randomized controlled trials? Why would anyone do a level one study or a level three study? And, you know, the short answer is that uh, they're, they're really hard. I mean, they are very, very difficult to carry out. And that's why they're pretty rare in criminal justice generally and in policing uh, generally. And what you see on this slide is just a couple of the different reasons why it's very, very difficult to carry out a randomized controlled trial. Some of these are methodological. Others are just real world um, uh, aspects of policing. So, you know, one of the things uh, you see here is power. John had mentioned in his introduction that oftentimes we're looking at, at rare outcomes. You know, we're looking at use of force, we're looking at complaints. In some departments, these are, are really rare events, which means uh, it's often difficult to have enough statistical power to measure differences. Uh, you know, we're not conducting these studies in a laboratory. These are RCTs that are carried out in, a field, in the field, and any number of things can happen in a community that would, uh, that would impact, uh, perhaps in a negative way, the, uh, the research that's being conducted. You know, I, I mentioned the random assignment. Um, oftentimes what might happen is, you know, a researcher like myself may randomly assign a group of officers to, to not get cameras, and then a chief may come to me and say, I need these five officers to, to absolutely have cameras. They're in our early intervention system. They need cameras. Well, I randomly assign them to the other group. So that's the kind of thing that can happen that, that uh, makes it difficult to carry out an RCT. Um, a couple of other things. You see the funny little cartoon there. Uh, about a parent getting uh, a notice that uh, the child is in the, the control group and will not get the treatment, which is a good education. If you think about that, that's kind of funny. But if you think about it in terms of, of the studies that we're thinking about, when you do a randomized control trial, you are, in fact, depriving half of the patrol force of that treatment of cameras for some period of time. And often that's a difficult sell, uh, particularly if the chief wants to get the cameras out on the street uh, uh, very quickly. Um, and then there's other issues to worry about, attrition, so officers moving out of, out of units, uh, retiring, you name it. The contamination piece is really difficult as well because, you know, in a laboratory, your, um, your humans who are in the control group, group would never be exposed to the treatment. That's what a control group is. Yet when you do an RCT in the field with police and body cameras, you may have officers that are in the treatment group and officers that are in the control group, and they're responding to the same calls. Well, that's contamination because now your control group officer is being exposed to the, uh, to the intervention. Anyway, so like I said, just wanted to lay that, lay that foundation so we understand the, the, the differences between uh, studies based on methodological rigor and that not all studies are in fact the same. The second piece I wanted to cover is just to uh, talk generally about the types of questions that are examined in, uh, in body-worn camera studies. And, and if you look at a list, there are a couple of lists going around. There are, I think, upwards of, of 40 studies now um, uh, on body-worn cameras. Most of the studies uh, focus in on the three things you see at the top of the slide. They look at officer perceptions of the technology, they look at citizen perceptions, or they look at what I call the big ticket items, use of force and complaints. Those are the, the, what I would say are the primary outcomes in the published studies uh, so far. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're the only questions. And you see also on this, uh, on this slide a lot of other 
what I think are really important questions that, that have not gotten enough attention to date from the researchers, and I think that that's what we'll be working on over the next several years is trying to fill the gaps here. Um, one of the things that John had talked about a lot is why are we seeing different differential impacts? Why do you see these giant declines in Rialto but not in Washington, D.C.? Um, you know, does, uh, does placing an officer or a camera on an officer affect his or her activity level? There's this notion that the surveillance aspects of the camera may lead to depolicing. Uh, there are not nearly enough studies looking at the downstream criminal justice effects. How does body-worn camera video footage affect prosecutor decisions, affect court outcomes? Uh, and and the, big, the big one is the cost-benefit analysis. And, and we're going to hear from Chip Cauldron today talking about their results in Las Vegas. And as far as I know, this is the, this is the first really thorough cost-benefit analysis of, uh, of body-worn cameras. You're going to hear about uh, some of these things that, uh, that I just mentioned. So in a minute or two, I'm going to talk about some work I did in Spokane and Tempe, talk, uh, specifically on officer perceptions and citizen perceptions. Um, the officer perception studies, there may six or eight studies have been done now. These are studies typically where, you know, a survey is given to officers or perhaps some focus groups or interviews asking them what they think about uh, this technology. Uh, the, the good studies, We'll do this multiple points in time. They'll ask officers before they get cameras. They'll ask them after so you can look uh, at change over time. For the most part, though, these studies show pretty consistent support uh, among officers for body-worn cameras. And the other important theme for me is when you look at the studies that, look, that, that examine officer perceptions over time, wherever the officers started at before cameras, some are very high already, some are lower. Um, once officers start wearing cameras, it's pretty pretty consistent, you see increases in their, their support. So once that period of the unknown goes away, once they start wearing it, generally that's where you see the, uh, the fairly large increases in support for the technology. Citizen perceptions, uh, there have been several studies that are kind of general population, nationally representative samples. Um, those studies have shown very high levels of support among citizens for police officers wearing cameras. Um, the, the one problem with a study like that is that the folks that get contacted and are a part of that study generally have very few interactions with police officers. Um, that's why I think we need to focus in on a, a, a subgroup of citizens. They're what I call the consumers of police services. These are folks who something bad happened, the police responded, they had an interaction with this citizen, and it was recorded. What do those folks think about police body-worn cameras? And there's only been a couple of studies that have been done, and I'm going to talk about two that I did in, in Spokane and Tempe. But so far, we're seeing fairly high levels of support among, uh, among that particular subgroup, the, the, the people that are interacting with uh, police and are actually being recorded. And then last, um, the, what, you know, the big ticket items, the, the complaint and, and use of force studies, uh, if you've done any work in this space at all, you know where Rialto, California is now. Um, it was one of the, the, I think it was the first study that came out. You can see the, the really enormous year-by-year -year reductions, the 88% decline in complaints, the 60% decline in use of force, uh, really, you know, impressive declines. And, and interestingly, a study came out just a few months ago, which looked at Rialto kind of four years later. And that study uh, by Alex Sutherland and colleagues found that, that those declines have persisted uh, over time. Uh, if you look at uh, just the kind of the, the directory of studies that have been done that have looked at these outcomes, most of them have found declines in either one or both of those outcomes. Um, in some cases, they're large. They're st uh, statistically significant. Other cases, they're declines, but they're not nearly as large as what we see in Rialto or other places. Uh, so, you know, Mesa, Orlando, Spokane, uh, Las Vegas Metro, and even the, the Boston interim report that came out a few, a few weeks ago. So that, um, the, the majority of studies have found declines, as I said, in one or both, though the, the size of those declines uh, varies. But we need to recognize that not every single study has found those reductions. And we're going to hear from Anita uh, in a little while talking about the, the D.C. Metro study. Uh, and that's what I think John was kind of getting at with the, the context matters, and I think we really need to dig in um, at this point and begin to have an understanding about that context and, and, and be able to tease apart why some departments have the declines and, and, and some don't. So 
that's kind of what we wanted to do just for the an introduction to, to lay the groundwork uh, for the rest of the presentation. So I'm going to I'm going to start off uh, talking about some of the more specific findings that we have, and I'm going to talk about officer and citizen perceptions, and then we'll hear from Chip talking about uh, the cost benefit stuff, and then Anita will will talk about the DC Metro study with a, a focus on on force and uh, and complaints. So I'm, I'm going to talk about results from uh, a study I just completed. Uh, the study was in, as I said, in Spokane, Washington, and, and Tempe, Arizona. It was funded by the Arnold Foundation. And when I got to, onto the scene with both of these police departments, the chiefs had already made two really important decisions. One, they had started, or they had come to the realization they had decided they were going to start a body-worn camera program, but they hadn't done so yet. And the second thing both chiefs had decided was that they, they were going to do a phase rollout. That is, they weren't going to give everybody cameras at once. Uh, in both cases, they wanted to do kind of a, a, a two-phase rollout with patrol. Give half of patrol cameras now, <clears throat> check things out, and then at some point down the road, the rest of patrol would get cameras. So I immediately began working with those chiefs. Think about the Maryland scale now. I didn't want to be at level three. I wanted to be at level five. So I, I worked with the chiefs to, to randomize that process of who was going to be in phase one, who was going to get cameras first, and then in both uh, uh, study sites, we waited six months. So these were six months, uh, uh, six month randomized controlled trial. So six months later, then the control group would get their their cameras. So essentially, what we did is in Spokane, we held a lottery with all the patrol officers to see who was going to get cameras uh, on May 15th, in May 15, 2015, and who was going to have to wait six months. Now, in uh, in both studies. We spent a lot of time gathering uh, officer perception data. And what we did is uh, I adopted a survey that was developed by a colleague of mine, uh, Chuck Katz. Uh, he had done an evaluation of the Phoenix body-worn camera study, and he created this great survey. Uh, it's self-report. Uh, it's got about 60 questions on it. It takes about 10 minutes for an officer to fill out. And you can see it, it, it gathers a wide range of uh, of information or perceptions of, of police about body-worn cameras. Just general perceptions, but also what they think it does to their behavior. Um, is it easy to use, evidentiary value? So a, a wide range of, of, of issues. And basically for each one, the officer just indicates his or her level of agreement with the item. You know, strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree, that kind of thing. And what we did in Spokane and Tempe is we administered this survey multiple points in time throughout the two-year study period, and uh, that included both before cameras were rolled out and, and after. We did it five times in Spokane, six times in, in Tempe. And when we would do this, it would, take, it would take a week in Spokane. It would take two weeks to hit all the, the roll calls in Tempe just because it's bigger. But we would go to every single roll call. Yeah, that included 9 p.m. on a Saturday night. That included 5 a.m. on a Monday. And we'd ask the officers to complete the survey. And the, the officers were great. Uh, they always uh, were very amenable to doing the survey. Our response rates were always uh, very, very high. So let's just talk about some of the results we got from the, the officer surveys. And, and I've got a ton of data uh, related to these officer surveys. I'm just going to give you a taste of some of the things that we saw in Spokane and Tempe. But the other thing I wanted to do is showcase a little bit this, this way we've come up with to illustrate uh, officer perceptions and also changes in perceptions over time. And that's what you see here on this line graph. So let me, let me take a second to kind of explain what you're looking at. So if you look at the bottom of this line graph, you can see the five different points in time where we administered our survey. The first time was April 2015 before anyone got cameras. The last time was uh, September of, of 2016. Now, you see two lines. That's because we had two groups, right? We had the randomized control trial. So the gold line is the, the officers that uh, were in the treatment group. They got their cameras first in May of 15, and then the green group got their cameras six months later. And basically what you see here uh, for each time we did the survey is the percentage of officers that agreed or strongly agreed with a statement. So the statement is the equipment is easy to use. Indicate your level of agreement with this statement. So if you look at April 2015, before anyone had cameras, uh, only 44.2% of officers in Spokane agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. So they didn't have cameras yet. You could tell they were a little bit concerned about how easy this was going to be for them. But follow that gold line. So 
the next month they get their cameras, and then the next time we did the survey was a month after that, June 15. After they had the cameras for a month, upwards of 80% of the officers then said, yes, I agree, strongly agree with that statement. And then you can see the, the green line that the control group kind of tracks low until they get their cameras in November, and then they experience the same kind of spike. Now, what you're seeing here is the, the layout's the same. It's just a different survey item. The survey item is citizens will be more respectful now that we're wearing police body-worn cameras. Um, back in April, you can see that 41% uh, of the officers agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. But what's interesting is how this tracks in the complete opposite direction of the other slide. So essentially what you're seeing here is over time increasing skepticism among officers about how body-worn cameras will positively influence citizen behavior. So that by the time we did the, the survey the last time, the, the percentage that agrees with that statement has been cut in half. It's down to 20% about. And I think there are a couple of different reasons for this. Um, and I could show you the Tempe slide and it would look exactly the same. We saw the exact same trend in Tempe. Uh, both uh, the Tempe and Spokane uh, departments have a policy that recommends but does not require notification. So I think many of the citizens that these officers are inter interacting with are not getting the notification. There's this idea of a civilizing effect that, you know, the cameras will change citizen behavior for the better. But one of the preconditions of that is that the citizen has to be aware of the camera if it's gonna change his or her behavior. So I think there's probably a piece there related to notification. And also, you know, police interact with folks all the time who um, are angry, upset, traumatized, uh, uh, mentally ill and in crisis, uh, intoxicated, who even if they got the notification, it might not matter. So. It's just interesting how that tracks over time and the skepticism that we see. The last I'll show for officer perceptions, this is Tempe. You can see along the bottom the, the six different times we administered the survey in Tempe. The, uh, the item here is uh, body-worn cameras are well received by my coworkers. So back in June of 15, before anyone in Tempe had a camera, you can see there was some concern among the officers. Less than 40% felt good about their, how their coworkers were going to uh, react to them wearing a camera. But then you can see how, for both groups really, it begins to track upward uh, fairly significantly as, um, you know, the cameras are integrated into the daily routines. And then by April of 17, we're talking, uh, you know, uh, close to 80% for the one group, over 80% for the other, uh, agreeing or strongly agreeing that this is going to be a good thing. Coworkers are going to be okay with it. So again, we've got a ton of findings. These were just a couple I wanted to show you to illustrate uh, some common themes that we're seeing, uh, and also then to, as I said, describe this, um, this visual characterization we've come up with to, uh, to show change over time. All right, um, you're getting a whole lot of me here. Uh, um, one more thing to talk about before I turn it over to, uh, to Chip, and that's uh, citizen perceptions. Now remember, when I was talking about citizen perceptions a while ago, I said you can look at the general population or you can look at that more specific group, uh, the consumers of police services. Well, that's what I focused in on uh, in, in Tempe and Spokane. Um, so we did several hundred interviews with uh, citizens who had uh, recorded encounters with police officers, and we did those anywhere from one to three weeks after the encounter. So basically what we did, and we did this during the randomized period, the six-month window, let me just describe Spokane. Every week, we, the researchers, would randomly select five officers who had a camera. And we would send those five officer names to Spokane PD. Spokane, uh, Marty Ellis and Records for us, which she would go into evidence.com, which is the cloud-based storage system they use. She would then pull contact information for every single citizen who interacted with one of those five officers in the, in the past seven days. And then Marty would send to us a very long list of uh, citizen names and contact information phone numbers. And then I had an army of grad students back in, in Phoenix with me who would begin working the phones. It was a phone survey. Um, it would take anywhere from, uh, from 15 minutes to upwards of an hour, depending on how chatty the, the citizen was. And we were asking them all sorts of questions about uh, their satisfaction with the encounter and how they were treated. But really the focus was on, uh, was on body-worn cameras, some you know, general perception stuff. Do you think they're a good idea, that kind of thing? Uh, but really the $64,000 question for us was, and oh, by the way, do you, uh, do you know if you were recorded uh, 
during this encounter, and if so, how did it affect your behavior? We did the same exact thing in Tempe, by the way, except there was a wrinkle, as you can see on the slide. Each week, we were randomly selecting 10 officers. We were selecting treatment officers and control officers so that we interviewed citizens who interacted with officers wearing cameras, as well as officers who were not. Again, this generated a ton of data. I just want to highlight a few things before I uh, wind down and turn it over to Chip. Um, you can see we, uh, we conducted several hundred, several hundred interviews in both places. What you see on this slide is uh, just the general perception stuff. Do you think body-worn cameras are a good idea, that kind of thing? Uh, so look at that first item. Uh, video cameras should be worn by all officers in Spokane and or Tempe PD. In Spokane, we interviewed 249 citizens. 85.9% of the citizens we interviewed agreed, strongly agreed with that statement. In Tempe, it was even higher, 92.2%. So you can look at the other items and you can see the big percentages. This shows among this very specific group of people, consumers of police services, pretty high levels of support for police body-worn cameras. So it's tracking in a way that is similar to the findings we see with uh, the general population studies. As I said, we also asked them about the, the encounter. You probably heard of procedural justice. Procedural justice has four components. Uh, we asked uh, an item for each of those four components. And, you know, the two departments that I worked, uh, worked with, um, of all the things we did together, this is probably the slide that they love the most, and you can understand why. What you're seeing here is some findings that indicate very procedurally just treatment by their police officer. So for example, the police officer you spoke to treated you with respect. 82% of the Spokane citizens we interviewed agreed, strongly agreed with that. Tempe, it was even higher, it was 92.5%. So obviously if you're a chief of police in, in, in Spokane or Tempe, you look at this and you feel pretty good about the, the way that your uh, officers are interacting with citizens. And the last finding I wanted to mention before turning it over to uh, the chip is that $64,000 question, we'd go through the whole survey and then we'd get toward the end and we'd say, and oh, by the way, um, do you know if you were recorded? And remember in Spokane, every single person we interviewed was recorded. We know that because we identified them through evidence.com. In Tempe, I pulled out those who we knew were not recorded uh, and just focused on those we knew who were. And in both cases, about three quarters of the citizens said they, they were not recorded. So they had positive impressions of how they were treated. They had positive impressions of body-worn cameras generally, but they are not, they were not aware, the majority of them were, were not aware, in fact, that they were being recorded. And again, I think this goes to the notification piece and some other things, uh, but it's an interesting finding, and we're seeing this in some other places too, that citizens are not recognizing or being told on a regular basis that, uh, that they're being recorded, which has some, I think, some pretty interesting implications for this idea of a civilizing effect. So that's all I have. Um, that was a whole lot of me, like I said. Now we're gonna turn to, uh, to Chip Cauldron, who's gonna talk about some work they've been doing in, in Las Vegas. All right, thank you very much, Mike. And I would just like to say that from my perspective, a whole lot of Mike White is a good thing. Um, Mike has been at the forefront of body-worn camera research for the last five or seven years, and he's made some really important contributions to our understanding about how they work and how they receive. So thank you very much, Mike. Um, I'm going to uh, do three things here. Um, I'm going to introduce and talk about uh, a certain aspect of a randomized control trial that we did with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Um, first, I need to talk about the study generally and the conditions under which it was done. Then I go very quickly get into the cost benefit analysis methodology and how, how we calculated these things and, and what our findings were. Um, so briefly, uh, this was, as I said, a randomized controlled trial. It was funded by the National Institute of Justice. Uh, in Las Vegas, we recruited more than 400 officers from the patrol division there. Um, and we had to recruit volunteers for the study because at that point in time, the uh, collective bargaining agreement w would not allow the sheriff to mandate that officers wear cameras. So we recruited uh, 400 volunteers. We recruited them primarily from four of the eight command areas in Las Vegas because 
to build out the infrastructure to support the cameras was a, a pretty expensive undertaking. So they only had four of their command areas built out with the infrastructure. So we recruit about 400 officers from actually about half of the uh, patrol force from about seven or 800 officers. Um, and then uh, once they were uh, selected into the study, we randomly assigned 200 cameras. So we had uh, two, about 200 in our treatment group and about 200 in the control group. Uh, we followed each officer for uh, a full year, monitoring their, their, their activities. And you see here that the study went from actually for about 18 or 19 months because we had a, a rolling recruitment process. We didn't bring all the officers into the study at the same time. We recruited them week by week and month by month until we got the numbers that we needed. So we followed each officer for a year, but the experimental conditions ran for about 18 or 19 months. And uh, we, we focused on some of the more traditional uh, outcome measures in the study. So we looked at complaints filed against officers, we looked at use of force incidents, and we looked at two measures of police activity. One was the likelihood that they would make an arrest given a call for service, and the other was the likelihood that they would issue a citation given a call for service. And uh, as you'll see soon, we included a cost-benefit analysis in this. So I need to talk uh, briefly about these study conditions. It's important to explain that we got the random randomization right uh, when we did a comparison between the 200 officers in the treatment group and the 200 officers in the control group about the cameras, we found no differences in uh, su such important variables as uh, gender, race or ethnicity, uh, number of years on the force, average number of complaints filed against them. So for all practical purposes, these two groups were equivalent, which is a good thing. And since we were using volunteers, we were concerned that maybe the best behaved officers would volunteer for the study. So we also did a comparison between the 400 study uh, participants and the rest of the officers in the Vegas Patrol Vision, and we found the same thing, that our, our study sample was uh, equivalent to the rest of patrol on all those major variables of concern, on age, ethnicity, years of experience, average number of complaints, uh, things like that. So we felt good about that, and it was important for us to establish that equivalency if we wanted to generalize from a study sample to the rest of the patrol division, which we needed to do in order to do this cost-benefit analysis. So the equivalency was good. Uh, we had low attrition from the sample. This was a, uh, a good benefit for us because, uh, you know, police officers change their assignments sometimes quite frequently, but we, uh, we had about 10 percent of our officers leave the sample during the, the time of the study, which is pr pretty good. And uh, this contamination issue, is, as Mike said, is important. Um, in Las Vegas, officers ride in single officer squad cars. So there's one officer per, per car, uh, but it's a quite frequent uh, occurrence that more than one car will arrive at you know, the scene of a call for service. So if one officer arrives at a scene and that, that officer is in the treatment group wearing a camera, and if another officer from the control group who's not wearing a camera arrives to the same scene, it's possible that that officer's behavior will be influenced by the presence of the officer with the camera. So we were able to track the frequency with which the officers sh showed up, uh, you know, the treatment and control officers showed up at the same call, and that happened less than 20% month by month throughout the study. So we felt good about that. And uh, one thing that Mike mentioned about, you know, things that can happen that can interrupt an experiment. But one of the things that happened uh, while we were in Vegas is there was a, a, an ambush of an, of an officer in a different state uh, ambush and killing of an officer in a different state. And so for a, for a week or so, the officers in, in Vegas wrote two officers per squad car. So we couldn't control that and we couldn't, you know, we couldn't make sure that the two officers in the car were both camera wearers or not camera wearers. So there was always, you know, some kind of uh, anomaly or some kind of, you know, uh, constraint that creeps up during these field experiments. We, uh, we feel very good and very positive about the fact that these, these experimental conditions held up over the 18 or 19th month, month period, which, uh, as Mike suggested before, give us a, gives us a great amount of confidence in the findings that we came up with. 
So uh, very quickly, uh, this is just a, a, a table with the overall findings regarding complaints and use of force. So if you look at the um, left-hand column under citizen complaint reports, you'll see that before they had the cameras, 54.6% uh, of the officers in the study in, in the treatment group had one or more complaint filed against them. And then after the cameras were introduced, that percentage went down to 38.1%. So that's a 16.5% reduction in the number of officers with at least one complaint filed against them. Look at the column to the immediate right of that. This is uh, the same data for the officers in the control group without cameras. They, uh, the reduction was 2.5% in terms of the number of officers with uh, one or more complaints filed against them. So there's a pretty strong difference between the treatment and control group here, and we found a similar strong difference uh, regarding use of force incidents. So the treatment group, the reduction in use of force incidents was about 11.5%, and the control group, it was plus 1%. So, so uh, use of force incidents actually increased slightly for the control group in the study. Both of these differences are, are statistically significant. So in Las Vegas, we did find uh, differences in the expected direction, these reductions for complaints and use of force incidents. Uh, now, in terms of officer activity, we did find slight increases in um, both uh, the likelihood of, of an officer making an arrest and the likelihood of an, likelihood of an officer issuing a citation if they're wearing cameras. So these uh, increases were also statistically significant and different from the control group. So in Vegas, we actually found that their, uh, their proactive policing or their productivity increased slightly as a result of wearing cameras. Now, here's where we get into the cost benefit findings. Uh, and just bear with me for a second here. Um, so what we did is uh, we looked and we estimated what it cost the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department to investigate a single complaint against an officer. So in the middle column here that says without BWC, we see that uh, the cost of investigating an incident for an officer without a camera is $6,776. And you can see that that is driven almost entirely by the 80 hours on average that detectives spend investigating and resolving complaints. For officers not wearing cameras, the cost for resolving each complaint is approximately $554. So a dramatically lower cost to resolve complaints for officers wearing cameras. That results in a savings per incident of $6,222. If you think about the fact that um, there are 1,400 officers in the patrol division You'll see in a few minutes that the, these cost savings add up uh, significantly. So that's looking at the cost per incident. We also looked at this slightly differently. We looked at the cost per officer per year. And so uh, in, in the left-hand column, you'll see that on average, there's less than one complaint per, per officer per year when they're wearing cameras. It's, it's actually 0.59. <clears throat> So the cost of resolving complaints for an officer for a year that's wearing a camera is $327. For officers without cameras, the, the, you know, the incidence of complaints is higher. It's 0.84 per officer per year. And that cost uh, is $6,776, which comes to $5,692 dollars per officer per year to resolve complaints. So again, the savings translate to $5,365 per officer per year. Uh, that's the, the basic uh, analysis that, that we did. There's a lot of complexity behind it. Um, and I will tell you that these estimates are driven almost entirely by complaints, as we did not find a statistically significant cost savings regarding use of force incidents. We did find it for complaints. 
So um, now, so that's that's the savings. We did our best, uh, the best job we could, to estimate the total cost of operating the body worn camera program in Vegas. So we figured that it costs about just over a thousand dollars per officer per year to equip them with a the camera and the licensing and the software and the storage and all that. And all the costs combined fell just under nine hundred thousand uh, dollars per year for Vegas, and that includes the infrastructure upgrades other capital expenses, uh, professional services, uh, maintenance of, of the equipment, uh, the cost of putting the training on. Uh, there's some personnel costs in terms of additional personnel that were needed to uh, monitor co uh, compliance with policy. Uh, they did not experience a, a large number of FOIA, FOIA requests in Vegas, but they did estimate what it cost them to respond to those requests. So when you put all those costs together, it comes out to just under $900,000 that it costs the department to operate this program. Now, what we did is, uh, let me go back to a slide. So these percentages on uh, this slide here, the 0.59 and the 0.84, those are the, uh, the numbers that we use to do the cost benefit analysis. So if you take um, the officers wearing cameras and you uh, you take the 0.59, multiply that by 1,400, that's the number of officers in the patrol division. So so, you, so that, that that's how you get to an estimate of how many complaints there would be for the entire division in one year. And you multiply that by 300 and $27, which is the cost per officer per year to resolve complaints, you get in the range of, uh, I think, $2.7 million. If you do the same calculation for officers without body-worn cameras, using the, the 0.84 and the $5,692 cost per officer per year, you come up with about, uh, I think, $6, $6 million. So having cameras on officers saves the department in the range of three to four million dollars per year according to those calculations. And again, we can make those um, those extrapolations because we found that the officers in the study sample were equivalent to the officers in the patrol division. So that's, that's the, the basics of the findings of our cost-benefit analysis. In the case of Las Vegas, again, we wouldn't expect this to be replicated equally across the country, but the reduction in complaints, and actually the reduction in the time it takes to resolve a complaint, translated into significant cost savings from the department, such that the savings probably paid for the camera program itself and some. Now, a couple points that I, I like to make here to uh, wrap up is that we need to be mindful that all complaints and all complaint systems are not equal. So there are some jurisdictions where uh, the community may have a high trust and respect for the way complaints are handled. And so they may use the system. There may be other communities where they really don't have much trust in that system. And so they may not file complaints at all because they don't trust the, you know, the department to resolve them in a fair manner. So low complaints does not necessarily always mean uh, you know, best behavior by officers. And there's also some, some situations I heard of where Civilians can uh, can file a number of complaints against an officer because they know if the officer gets a certain number of complaints, he or she will be taken off the streets for a while, you know, to get those complaints resolved. So you could have a situation where there are a high number of complaints, but again, those complaints are not necessarily reflective of bad behavior by officers. There could be other things driving them. So it's important to understand how these complaint processes work if you're going to use complaints as an outcome. Also, it's important to remember it's not just the reduction in the number of complaints, but it's the reduction in the time that it takes to resolve them that factors into the, the findings that we had. And that in most instances with video footage, officers that have complaints filed against them have the complaints resolved in their favor largely to about 70% of the time. And um, obviously, if, um, if officers are not complying with policy, routinely, then that can confound your, your findings as well. 
uh, we found in Vegas that uh, during the course of the study, compliance with policy increased to where it got to about 75% towards the end. So um, that's uh, that's the end of my presentation on cost benefit. I'll be you know I'll be around towards uh, a little bit later if anybody wants wants to ask any questions. But let me turn this now over to um, Anita. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Chip. Uh, today I'd like to provide a quick overview of our study design, talk about the stakeholder engagement and open science practices we implemented around our study, and then discuss our findings and some of the key takeaways. Um, so we were able to implement that level five randomized control trial with the Metropolitan Police Department uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, the eligibility criteria to participate were pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, you essentially have to be active, full-duty status, have a rank of sergeant or below, and be in a public-facing role in a patrol district. Uh, this gave us a sample of about 2,220 members who were randomly assigned to treatment and control groups, and this was uh, the largest RCT that has been completed to date, as far as I know. Uh, so determined, to determine the effect of the body cameras, we compared the control and treatment groups on four have families of outcomes. Uh, so first we looked at police use of force, and within that we looked at both kind of serious uses of force as defined by MPD policy and other uses of force to see if there may have been any differential effect of the cameras across these two categories, the idea being that for kind of the lower level uses of force, it might not be a change in the incidents, but perhaps the reporting, so we wanted to kind of separate those out. Uh, with complaints, we looked at the overall number filed, as well as those that were sustained and not sustained. Uh, policing activity covers a couple of different components, uh, so we wanted to get a window into officer discretion, and so we looked at the more discretionary types of arrests, such as simple assault, disorderly conduct, and traffic arrests. We also looked at domestic violence calls for service and domestic violence arrests, as we have a mandatory arrest law in D.C. Um, and within that category, we also looked at uh, trying to get a window to citizen behavior by looking at officer injuries incurred um, on duty as well as arrests for assaults against police officers. Um, and then judicial outcomes, uh, we began to get a look at how body cameras are affecting kind of downstream processes. So does the presence of a camera on the arresting officer affect charges prosecuted? And court outcomes, you know, was there a trial, guilty, not guilty verdict, was there a plea, was the case dismissed? Uh, within this, we also looked at how much time officers were spending in court to see if there was any time saved there with the introduction of body-worn camera footage. Um, so everything I just described, uh, the randomization protocol, the outcomes and how they were defined and measured, the specific data sources, the precise statistical models, was all written up and documented in detail in our pre-analysis plan, um, which is what you're kind of seeing a screenshot here of. And importantly, we did all of this before any of us actually saw the data from the study, and it was pre-registered on the Open Science Framework, and again, that's the screenshot you're seeing. Um, this is one of the uh, best practices in open science, the goal of which is to really make scientific research transparent and accessible. Um, so in doing this, we wanted to promote the transparency and the scientific integrity of the study. Um, as those of you who work with data know, there is a decent amount of discretion you have as to how you do your analyses, and there can be conscious or subconscious biases that can affect how that work plays out. So by writing all that up in the pre-analysis plan um, and publishing that beforehand, it really committed all of us, kind of tied all of our hands to do the analyses exactly as described. So when the results were released down the road, there was not really a question of how we got to those findings. Um, so as I noted, the pre-analysis plan was posted to the Open Science Framework, and we kind of used it as a jumping off point to uh, engage, in, engage our stakeholders around the actual body-worn camera program and our policies, as well as the study itself. Um, and this process, which involved going to a variety of different groups, high school students, university students, criminal justice partners in the district, um, civil rights groups, et cetera, uh, it was a great way for us to solicit feedback on the study design while also kind of proactively talking about the study. So again, when people would see the results down the road, they would know how we got there. Um, 
And we had over a dozen such sessions with various groups. Um, and uh, we also participated in conferences for both practitioners and researchers. Uh, one thing we did at uh, each session was to ask attendees to make their best guesses about the effects of body cameras on use of force and complaints as a way to sort of tease out the different intuitions people might have about how these devices actually work. Um, and so what you're seeing here is uh, different graphs of how different groups uh, made predictions. And so in the red, you see predictions about body cameras causing an increase in use of force. Blue is a prediction that body cameras would decrease use of force, and the gray is no difference. And as you can see, people's guesses were pretty distributed across the three categories. Um, and they're even kind of more distributed if you look at uh, audience guesses on complaints. Um, and so this exercise allowed us to sort of powerfully reinforce the need to use this kind of rigorous scientific approach to actually figure out whether our, tuition, our intuitions are right and exactly how body cameras are working in the district. Um, and now for the results, um, kind of the baseline overall takeaway is that we found that body cameras had no detectable effect on any of the outcomes of interest. Um, for each outcome, we report our best estimate of the effects of body cameras as well as a margin of error, which in the slide you're seeing right now is shown by the bars extending away from that square point estimate. Um, and that interval expresses our uncertainty. Roughly speaking, when a confidence interval goes from the negative to zero and positive values, uh, we talk about this as the result being statistically insignificant or null. Uh, more simply, we would interpret this to mean that body cameras had no detectable effect on the outcome in question. Um, so for the use of force slide you're seeing right now, we estimate, uh, we report our results in terms of 1,000 officers. So a group of 1,000 officers with cameras would document we get our estimate is about 75 more uses of force in a year than officers without body cameras. However, as the bar dis, uh, displays, the data are also consistent with the real effect of body cameras being anywhere from a decrease of about 100 documented uses of force to an increase of about 240. And again, that's per 1,000 officers per year. So again, because it spans that negative zero and positive value, uh, we conclude here that the presence of the body cameras had no detectable effect on police use of force. And we see kind of the same thing with complaints. Again, we span negative zero and positive values. And with arrests for disorderly conduct, again, it's a pretty wide interval there. And that's true for all the other um, outcomes I me we measured as well that I mentioned earlier. So uh, what do we make of this? Um, so I think it was mentioned earlier that context might have something to do with it. Um, so there might be something unique about DC. So where body cameras might help improve some of these outcomes in other departments. Um, in DC, as you know, the police force for the capital city, MPD experiences sort of elevated scrutiny. Um, we've also had substantial reform efforts over the past 20 years. Um, MPD entered into a memorandum of agreement with DOJ in the early 2000s, underwent about eight years of federal oversight, um, and a recent report again found that these reforms are still in place. So these, this kind of effort in the past might have helped mitigate some of the issues that we're also hoping body cameras would address, and that would in turn limit the added effect of body cameras in the context of DC. So that might be a possible explanation. Another explanation is that the null finding that cameras do not have an effect on these outcomes might just be real. Um, it might be the case that body cameras do not, in fact, affect the measured behaviors. Video footage does not affect the measured court outcomes. Um, another possible explanation is that there might be an effect, but it is hidden. Uh, of course, in the district, we did not go from a world in which we had zero cameras to body cameras. We, prior to that, had, you know, there's plenty of citizen cameras or CCTV, and we're adding body cameras to that mix. So there might be just not enough additional room for body cameras to have a significant marginal effect. Another possibility is that there's a spillover issue in which a control officer might be affected by his or her awareness of a nearby colleague in the treatment group who is wearing a body-worn camera. Um, another version of spillover might just be kind of the introduction of the body-worn camera program to the department may have caused kind of a broader shift in the norms and behaviors across the force, even though only a subset of officers received cameras as part of the random assignment. Um, so 
to unpack the null finding and the spillover issues a little bit more, we did take a look at uh, time series analysis, tracking both the treatment and control groups over time. This analysis allows us to consider whether there might have been, you know, strong initial effects that have dissipated as officers got used to the cameras. Um, it, might have, it might help us also capture whether both the treatment and control groups change behaviors so that, you know, in our study, we compare the two to see if there's a difference to detect an effect of the cameras. But perhaps if both groups' behaviors changed, then the difference would be zero, but we might be able to see that in time series analysis. Um, but as you can see, this line is very flat. Um, we're not seeing much change in behavior on use of force or um, complaints filed uh, against officers over time for the treatment group or the control group. Um, in addition, we looked at, you know, across all the incidents, approximately one third of our uh, incidents had no cameras present whatsoever. Another third had only officers with cameras on scene. And so, again, we're, the spillover issue seems to be contained. Um, and we also find no effect of body cameras on things that shouldn't be as affected by spillover, such as domestic violence reports or the time officers spend in court. Uh, so that wraps up kind of the discussion of the results, but I want to return back to uh, our emphasis on the engagement piece. Uh, we really wanted to ensure we provided a clear, accessible explanation of what we did so that anyone, whether a curious citizen or professional researcher, could understand exactly how we approached this in D.C. So we built a dedicated website to that effect, and you can see the link there now. Um, anyone can go to the website and see all of our materials, kind of clear, accessible explanations of what happened um, and how we did it. We also wanted to return to the community after the findings were released to engage in a dialogue about what they meant for the police department and the district. So we arranged a number of community conversations in the city and also presented our findings kind of to the practitioner community at IACP last fall. Um, just to wrap up here, I think uh, the biggest implication of our study is that then we should recalibrate our expectations of body cameras, especially in contexts similar to D.C. Uh, policing is obviously very complicated, and while technology can support this complex work, uh, we would suggest that it alone cannot achieve some of our public safety goals, especially around questions of use of force and complaints. Um, another big takeaway for us was around the importance of integrating open science practices from the outset. Um, it obviously took us a lot of time to do all of those stakeholder engagement sessions. So we had upwards of 12 or 15 of them, uh, but it helped us really make clear our commitment to transparency and scientific integrity. And again, when the findings were released, there weren't really many questions about the validity of the research, so we could really focus on the implications of the findings and what we should take away from them. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this really gave us a novel way to engage the community and kind of open up government. Um, and lastly, I think this was alluded to earlier on as well, there's clearly a lot more research to be done on body cameras. Um, our findings in D.C. certainly add to the conversation here, but I would suggest that, you know, how video footage is used in the courts, um, diving deeper into community perceptions, and as well as additional applications that weren't really part of the earlier conversations of body cameras, but certainly might have an important effect, such as how video footage is used in training. Um, uh, so basically, there's a lot more to look into, and uh, I will wrap up and leave it right there. Thanks, Anita. This is John again. Am I being heard? I just want to check. Yes, you are, John. Yes, you are. Right. So just, I, hopefully, we I don't don't see on my screen if we have questions. I want to thank the presenters first of all. Um, I think they were all very grounded presentations. Anita mentioned that they presented to practitioners at IHCP, and I know that among our listeners, uh, the webinar viewers, there are many practitioners and there's some academics, so I hope that we spoke intelligently and meaningfully to both audiences. I think we did. I think we really nailed that. But I want to say one thing about that. I think Las Vegas is pretty unique. Uh, there are two things that may be impacting costs favorably there. Uh, one is that they have a very well thought out process when requests to view videos come Hello. in, whether it's EPO, Freedom of Information Act, or just more casually. They take, have the person go to a room, view the video, uh, understand what the video is, and then before the department provides 
charge. More states are coming out with um, laws and regulations regarding body, body worn camera video as well as uh, FOA Freedom of Information. <laughs> Some states are public record states in which it's presumed you have the right to see that. Some states are mm -hmm. stipulated that body worn camera footage is law enforcement investigative data. So if they're exempt from public records or the presumption is that they're, they're exempt unless the, the subject gives a compelling reason why they need that. So I'm not sure where Las Vegas stands in that uh, sort of continuum from public records to restricted records, but that's gonna affect your cost greatly. I think the mechanism that Las Vegas uses to have people screen, view the video, tell them what exactly they want both reduces cost for the person, but also probably reduces cost appreciably for Las Vegas. The, chip, the figure that Chip put out there, 13K for FOIA requests, is pretty minuscule for a jurisdiction like Las Vegas and, and the number of encounters they have with the tourist population there. So uh, maybe we'll follow up with Las Vegas and confirm that you know some of those ideas. Um, Denise, do you want to go to the questions? Hopefully we have enough time for a few. John, we had one we question. To, uh, I'm sorry, Denise. Uh, we had one question submitted by uh, someone during the registration process, so I'm going to just read that one off and see if we can get some responses to that, okay? Great. So the uh, question is, um, I'm interested in hearing from other law enforcement agencies what measures they may be employing in order to ensure greater compliance in relation to utilizing uh, body-worn cameras and their, you know, categorizing the videos. So it's a question about, um, you know, what, what metrics are used to, uh, to monitor policy compliance. And so I would just ask if there's anybody participating today who would, who would like to um, offer a response to that question. All right, you know what? Um, There's another question here that I'm seeing, Chip. I don't know if you're seeing it. I think it came in a few minutes ago, and it reads, regarding cost savings analysis, EWC relationships to use of force, was any data collected in reference to hesitation in response to resistance, battery against law enforcement officers, or injury in the line of duty? But basically, if I can rephrase that, was there any benefits seen in any of these studies in officer safety? Um, most of the studies have not addressed officer safety issues directly. So it's hard to get, it's hard to respond to that question, John. Right, great. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's, it's sort of by logical extension, if it's having a civilizing effect, that it, that should translate into reduced injuries to officers, less use of force, obviously would, would translate into right. that. So I think that's the, the sort of the natural outcome of less use of force, less injury to both officers and to citizens, and hopefully yeah, research think, can unpack that in the future. Yeah, I agree. So that's a reasonable assumption to make, but it needs to be tested. Yep. Um, for the um, gentleman who asked the question about policy compliance, since we didn't get a response here, um, I'll just have our, our folks compile some of the things that we've, we've learned from the departments that we're working with, okay? It's pretty straightforward. I know they look at, um, they tend to look at, uh, you know, issues around activation and deactivation of cameras. They tend to look at statistics about how long, you know, how many minutes or hours during a shift the camera's operating. They do look at, uh, they audit issues around the uh, appropriate tagging of you know types of video footage and things like that, but we can um, we can we can compile some information and respond to you uh, in a short while. Okay. All right. I see one other question there, and I'm going to use my prerogative as the grant program manager. I'm going to ask them like, so what are the top three challenges in getting BDWC data to conduct studies? Uh, it's a question that came from Steve Tuttle, I believe it is. So John, this is Mike. The question is, what are the three challenges in terms of getting data from police uh, departments? Yeah, the top three challenges in getting data for these studies. 
BWC data? Well, I think certainly, um, you know, the, the use of force data, the citizen complaint data is, is fairly sensitive. And uh, if you don't have a working relationship with the police department, you're just a, you know, researcher kind of making a cold call, that's, that's sometimes a tough pill to swallow for a police department that you're gonna turn over those, those data. So I would certainly say um, that that can be fraught with challenges. The, um, you know, the other thing is the, the challenge associated with uh, just the timing of things. So, you know, if you're conducting a randomized controlled trial, that's a, that's a study that's being done in real time, uh, which means, you know, if, if you're working with a police department as a researcher, you've got to convince a chief that it's, it's going to be six months, a year, 18 months before you're going to have something reasonable to say in terms of findings. But also, if you think about the primary outcomes, use of force, complaints, um, you know, those things often require investigations. And if you, you know, we should be, we should be focusing, on, focusing on not just the, the fact that there was a complaint or there was a use of force, but look at the, the, the investigation and disposition of that over time. So um, that just kind of adds to, the, to the, the challenges associated with returning <laughs> findings and, and creating that feedback loops, loop. So those are, are, are a couple of things. The one thing I would say about the citizen interviews, um, that was the, the work that we did in Tempe and Spokane. That was enormously labor intensive. Um, the the students that I had working on on that project, well, first they had to be very very well trained because um, you know we're calling people who had a recent interaction, and, and we didn't know what the nature of that interaction was. So we didn't know if they were a suspect that was arrested, if they were a victim, um, uh, if they were a witness. We do, we do know that both departments did some screening to, to make sure we, won't, we weren't calling folks that had experienced really traumatic events. But the labor intensive, intensiveness of that uh, in terms of um, uh, response rates and, and getting people on the phone, and that was, that was extremely difficult. And I think that's why there haven't been very many, very many studies like that. Um, and that was a tough sell too, and, and it would be for other researchers to try to convince police departments to provide, in fairly short order, the contact information of people that their officers have interacted with so researchers could then begin to call them and ask them questions about the, that contact. So those are just a couple of thoughts off the top of my head. Thanks, Mike. That's great. So maybe I'll close with sort of uh, putting a, a, a finer point on that. I think the other issue, you, which I think you alluded to, is trust. Um, I think all of you, I don't know Anita very well, but I, I know Chip and I know Mike, and I, I would say that both of you, or all three of you, are what would be called pracademics. You, you have your feet firmly planted in the academic world and know methodology, but you also know what policing is about in, in the real world, and you've got track records of building trust with law enforcement agencies that you're not coming in there with a, a quote-unquote Ivy Tower agenda to prove how bad their practices are or, or you know, with a, a preordained agenda. So I think that's key. And for those of you uh, practitioners, you know, you're not gonna, you may not be able to do an RCT, but you may be able to do a level one or level two uh, research project. You may just be able to track your use of force and citizen complaints before and after um, you implement your body-worn camera program and to avoid some of the pitfalls you know, reach out to your academic partners if you're lucky to be near a major university. There may be some graduate students who can look at your data and say, okay, you know, it's reasonable to assume that you had some impact, but, you know, maybe there's a seasonality. You know, I'm from Chicago. If somebody implemented a program in November that instituted body-worn cameras, they're likely to see a, a drop in use of force and complaints in uh, December, January, and February. Uh, if they compare those three months with the pri prior three months, you know, the, the drop may be attributable to weather, less interaction, fewer people outside. So a researcher will be able to, to sort of keep you honest um, and, say, and put your, um, your findings in context. So um, we've talked about RCTs today, and that is the gold standard, but we re recognize, as Mike so uh, explained it very well, that they're, they're difficult to do, they're expensive, they're resource intensive. So I encourage you, if you're doing body-worn camera implementation, try to track the numbers as best you can.
And with that, thanks. I thank you all, and I thank Denise for putting together yet another great webinar from CNA.